you notice, students, please. All right, teachers, if you need to move students, if they're not going to listen to you, please do, even right now. Eighth grade. All right, students, when we are told to be quiet, that means we need to be quiet, please. If you'll notice around campus, lots of signage around campus, uh, just uh, promoting our clean campus. Um, we want to promote and always have a clean campus, and we, meaning me, uh, I'm willing to pick up trash around campus, and I'm asking you to help out as well to pick up trash around campus. So um, please help with that. We've got a clean campus campaign going on throughout uh, our campus here, and we want to just encourage everyone, uh, as the signs say, to uh, don't drop it, but trash it, and be a part of the solution, not the pollution and uh, we there those are catchy slogans catchy phrases and uh, they can help us all to be a part of a clean campus and I want to encourage everyone to be a part of this clean campus campaign not just during the time that we're promoting it but always every day young people I can't emphasize enough about keeping a nice clean campus so be a part of that uh, we've got a number of athletic events going on games going on today they're all away but if you're able to make it to any of those please uh, go and support our teams we have uh, the varsity uh, football game or football team will be away for a double header away I believe down at Redlands Christian and uh, so they will be playing two games this afternoon and then our uh, ladies volleyball teams junior high JV and varsity They'll all be away today as well over at Florida Christian, and I think those are four, five, and six. So uh, please make plans if you can be there, but I uh, want to uh, pray for our teams. want to encourage everyone to work hard uh, throughout this week. We're getting closer to the end of the first quarter, and we want to just remind everyone, everyone, everyone to be a part of uh, working hard uh, in your school uh your grades just working hard in this first quarter as we come closer and closer to the end of the uh, first quarter um, in just a moment we're gonna have our verse of the uh, the school year verse but um, before we say that uh, I had the privilege this weekend to um, visit my little granddaughter Rose and I think there's a picture up there I want to show her off again if that's all right um, you'll have to uh, understand that but I guess not so that's okay. We'll show her around uh, some time, and I've been showing others. Oh, she is. There's little Rose. Isn't she beautiful? Aren't you glad she doesn't look like Mr. Thompson? I was able to hold her and hold her and hold her, give lots of kisses, and I already miss her greatly. Hey, let's look at our verse. Let's look at our verse, and let's everyone stand at this time, and let's quote our verse together. Everyone. Let me have your attention, please. We're going to pray in just a moment. I love energy. I definitely love energy and enthusiasm with our students. But uh, now that we're in chapel, I'm going to ask everyone, and now I'm going to tell everyone, I do want everyone to be calm and focusing in on chapel. And uh, teachers, if you just are noticing that there are students that just need to probably move because they can't control their themselves, and please help me with that, please. I've got a big room here, and I can't do it on my own. But I want us to focus now and get our attention on the things of the Lord. That's why we're going to quote our verse and then have a word of prayer and then move into our worship time. Everyone together, Psalms 119.18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for a new day and a new week that you've given to us. We pray that you would give us a wonderful week. Pray that you'd be with each of our students, all of our teachers. Bless them. Give them a great day and a great week here at Westwood Christian School. We pray that our students would work hard, that they'd do their very best in each of their classes, and that they would be focused in on their uh, schoolwork. We pray for the athletic games going on 
Uh, this afternoon, we pray for safety as they travel. We pray for safety as they play, help them to play to the best of their abilities and exemplify wonderful godly testimonies as they play football and volleyball. Bless our teachers as they guide and direct and educate and train and influence our students. And we pray that you'll bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Please worship with us as we sing Man of Sorrows and Jesus, thank you.
Amen. Great job, worship team. Thank you. Praise and honor unto thee. Lord, you deserve praise and honor. Young people, thank you for singing out today. Um, thought you did a good job, although still as I scan across our group here, uh, it's interesting, so many that aren't singing, and I'll tell you what, God loves, God loves a heart that wants to sing out and sing praise to him. So can I just encourage you to sing? You say, well, Mr. Thompson, I don't know how to sing. I can't sing. Well, I can't either, but I try. I try. And uh, I know the Lord loves to hear wonderful young people, and I think we have the best young people in America here in this uh, uh, auditorium. And listen, sing out to the Lord. Sing out to the Lord. He loves to hear you sing. Praise and honor unto thee. And uh, God definitely deserves uh, praise and honor. Well, it's a wonderful privilege every uh, Monday morning to start out with chapel, and I'm so glad we do. And uh, I want you to take your Bibles, your chapel notebooks, and listen to Mr. Schroeder. Mr. Schroeder always does an amazing job in teaching God's Word, preaching God's Word. And uh, I know you'll get something out of today, so you listen up as Mr. Schroeder um, preaches this morning. Mr. Schroeder. Okay, so if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2 this morning, and uh, I know I always have students, what do we put in the heading, okay? So the title is Paul's Prayer List, Paul's Prayer List, and we're in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and so for the scripture passage, you can put that verses 1 through 4, and if you want to put a comma and put verse 8, that'll be fine. And hopefully that'll help you fill out the start of your sermon notebook this morning. I want to read to you verse 8, and then we'll pray and we'll get into God's Word. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for all that you've given us. We thank you for the Word of God. And we thank you for all these students that are here this morning. Lord, we pray that your word would penetrate their heart, that it would change their life, that they would leave chapel with a determination to look more like you. And Father, we pray just as we, we, we talk about in that verse, that we would look into your word. We would, and James tells us that the word is a mirror, that we'd look into that word, we'd examine ourselves. Father, that we'd prepare ourselves to serve you. So many young people this morning, and who knows what you want to do with them, Lord. And so we pray that this be a place of preparation where you just soak their life in Scripture, and Father, that they're equipped for whatever you're going to call them to do with their lives. And Father, we pray that that would be the focus, that would be what's on their mind this morning as they hear the Word of God. Father, we pray that you just uh, fill me with your Holy Spirit and fill those that are hearing the Spirit of God. Let him confirm truth where truth is preached and convict where convict, conviction is necessary. And we just surrender the service to you and pray that you work in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, next week's chapel is going to be a little bit different. We're going to do something called Partners in Prayer. And so I thought that we'd spend this chapel maybe getting ready for Partners in Prayer by looking at the Apostle Paul's prayer list. And one of the things that would help you as you walk into Partners in Prayer is that if you had a prayer list, I, I don't know how many of you have that. If you, for your devotional time, you have things that you're praying about. I know in class, at least in Bible class, we take prayer requests and we pray for certain things that are on our heart and mind. And, and we're thankful and grateful when we see those prayers answered. This morning in first hour, I already had Life of Christ class and somebody gave a prayer request that was a great encouragement to me because I'd been praying for that person and they actually gave me a report in their prayer request that that person was doing well. And so that's part of what prayer is supposed to do in our life. Mr. Thompson was encouraging you, you know, that at the beginning of chapel you ought to sing because you ought to be singing for God, not for the people that are around you. But we also ought to be praying because God, God wants us, he desires us to be in fellowship with him and to, 
and to talk with him and to bring our requests before him. Well, the Apostle Paul, he knew a lot about this because he spent some time in prison. And in prison, it's hard to do a lot of ministry. It's true that while he was in prison, he wrote some books of the Bible that we call the prison epistles. But other than that, the ministry that the Apostle Paul could have in prison is he could pray. See, prayer is something that every Christian can do on the behalf of other Christians, but they can also do it so that they're in fellowship with God. And yet I wonder how often in America we take prayer seriously. You know that you have chapel every Monday. How often do you pray that God would actually speak to you in chapel? Um, Some of you go to church. I wish more of you would go to church. But if you go to church, do you pray prior to going to church that God would speak to you? That it's not so much about the person preaching, but it's the fact that you're sitting under the sound of God's word and you want something to happen in your life. Well, the Apostle Paul took prayer very seriously. Like I told you, there's times that he was in prison, and that's the only thing he could do for the church was to pray for them. And he gives us a prayer list in 1 Timothy chapter 2 that can help us to be a guide. Now, many of us are familiar with the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount. This is a similar situation. This isn't a specific prayer or list of prayer requests, but rather a pattern of prayer that Paul says we ought to have. Now, I started... Uh, chapel by reading to you verse 8. So let's, let's go back to verse 8. And verse 8 talks to us about how we should pray. What should be our attitude? Where should we be at spiritually when we pray? So look at verse 8. First of all, Paul says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. And so wherever you are, God's will is that you would pray and that you would pray for Christians that are everywhere. You know, there's Christians today that are suffering persecution on a level you and I cannot understand. Um, I don't often recommend things uh, on the internet, but if I were to recommend something, Voice of the Martyrs would be something that I'd recommend. Sometimes they've come and they've visited. And if you want to see what other Christians face, well, let's think about this, right? America pulled out of Afghanistan. And when America pulled out of Afghanistan, many Christians came under persecution and are suffering persecution right now under the Taliban. And many of those Christians had to make a decision. They knew that when the Americans pulled out, maybe this was a time I should leave and go into a neighboring country. But many Christians decided, no, I'm not going to abandon my country. I'm not going to give up the Christian influence that we can have in this country. And they stayed in Afghanistan. And certainly if they're women... They're suffering all kinds of persecution because they made a decision to stay in their country and to pray for their country. God says, Paul says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. So everywhere you are, anytime you are, you can pray. Too often I think now, whenever we're somewhere and we have a few minutes time, Rather than spending that time in prayer, waiting for the next thing to happen, we're so quick to pull out the phone. Well, you know one thing you could put on your phone. I I suppose on your phone somewhere there's notes. You could put your prayer list on your phone. And then you could have that list with you wherever you are, and you could spend some time in prayer. Prayer everywhere. I will for that that men pray everywhere, but look at the condition that God says that we should be in. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Uh, James says that uh, the righteous man, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do we have holy hands when we pray? Do we have holy hands when we pray? Uh, When I was growing up, we were in the Lutheran church, Uh, I was in the Lutheran church, and we were told, you know, that when we pray, we should fold our hands, right? Uh, Paul says here that when we pray, we should lift up holy hands, okay? It's the idea that your hands uh, don't have anything in them that would make you guilty. When When I read that phrase, what echoes in my mind is Pilate washing his hands uh, when he condemns Jesus. So we ought to lift up holy hands, If we want to see answers to prayer, if we want to truly communicate with a God that is holy, then we ought to live lives that are filled with practical holiness. You know, God is holy. In Jesus' um, 
pattern of prayer that he gave the disciples, the Lord's Prayer. He said, hallowed be thy name. It was a reminder that the person that we're addressing is holy. It doesn't make sense to petition a holy God if we're not willing ourselves to be holy. If we're sitting in the midst of our sin, it doesn't make sense to petition our God for anything else until you get that sin taken care of. God desires that we would live lives where it would be easy and normal to have conversation with him because we're lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. When we come to prayer, we, we should not come to prayer when we're angry. We should not come to prayer when we're angry. If we're angry, we need to get our anger settled before we ever enter into prayer. And we shouldn't be doubting. We shouldn't be doubting. That is, we ought to pray in faith. Uh, do you believe that God can answer your prayer? Now, the longer you pray and the more prayer requests you have, Lord willing, hopefully, the more answers of prayer that you see, and that builds your confidence both in God and in prayer. But God says that if you're going to approach him in prayer, you ought to believe. You ought to have faith, and you ought not have anger. You ought not have anger. So that's how we pray. But what was Paul's prayer list? What was Paul's prayer list? And we find that same chapter, verses 1 through 4. Verses 1 through 4. So let's look at some truths now about prayer. And then I want you to be thinking, as I go over each one of these, how would you make a prayer list according to these ideas? So chapter 2 and verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So Paul is exhorting. He's, he's acting like a coach on the sideline Think of that coach that's yelling at you on the sideline, but he's, they're yelling good things. They're yelling good things. Now, I'll, I'll admit, I, I don't have the coaching personality. Uh, I, I've never coached anything. Um, I have a wife who does coaching, and uh, I can remember uh, PE, though. I lived in a state where if you didn't play a sport, and, and that was me, uh, if you didn't play a sport, you had to be in PE every day from kindergarten through 12th grade. This is the state of Illinois. For some reason, at that time, I know this is going to be hard for you to believe, but under some administration, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the health official for that organization, and somehow Illinois made it where we had to be in PE every single day. And uh, if you were in a sport, then you could get out of PE during uh, your sport and go to study hall, but as soon as your sport was over, you were back in PE. And I remember some, one of the hardest things for me as a student is, is the coach or the PE teacher, which, but everybody called them coach, you know, yelling. Now they were yelling good things, right? And uh, it's this idea underneath the word exhort. Paul is exhorting, he's commanding, he's encouraging young Timothy that, listen, the first thing you need to be doing is prayer. That's the first priority in our life and in our church service. When you get up in the morning, your morning should start in prayer. If God wakes you up in the middle of the night and uh, you, you can't get to sleep, pray. Paul says we ought to give a first place priority to prayer, but then he begins to list these different types of prayer. And these different types of prayer, one of the things about prayer is that it ought to change your attitude, it ought to change your demeanor, it ought to change your testimony. And the first one is supplications. And when you look into the word supplications, it's this idea of um, begging God. It's this idea of total dependence upon God. So what are supplications? The things that are out of control. This morning when I got up and I went uh, to go to my car, I always pick up my newspaper and try to read as much as I can through the plastic before I throw it at the front of my house. And today the headlines were very, very big. If you want something to pray for today, pray for Puerto Rico. The headline was very big, some kind of massive, it was a hurricane by the time it hit, Hurricane Fiona, I believe, and there's a lot of flooding, and there's a lot of people without power, 
And when I think about Puerto Rico, I've never had the chance to go there, but I feel like it's probably a lot like the Dominican Republic. And once you get in the rural areas of the Dominican Republic, or I'm sure the rural areas of Puerto Rico, it's very similar. A flash flood, that could be very serious because of the way their, their houses are built and the way their structures are built. And so um, you need to pray for the people in Puerto Rico. You need to pray that they get their power back. You need to pray that, they, that their homes are restored. Okay? Supplications are for things that are outside of our control. It's like when a hurricane hits. Okay? Hurricanes cause chaos, and Mr. Schroeder does not like chaos. Okay? So if a hurricane hits, I've got to get everything that I can organized outside before I will ever feel comfortable. And then during the storm, I guess this is sad to say, I'm not really so concerned about everything that's going on in the storm, but the mess that's going to be afterwards that I need to clean up. The things that we can't control. It's when we have a health issue that's not our fault. When we have a health issue that's not our fault and there's nothing we can do about it, or worse, when there's somebody that's in our family that has a health issue, and we're not a doctor, we can't do anything about it. Supplications are those things that come into life, and God says that this is just what happens to man. There's things that come in your life that you literally completely don't have any control over. Um, it can be things that are happening in your family. It can be things that are in relationships. It can be concerns that you have over your brothers and your sisters, and they're older, and you can't change them, and really they have to make the decision to change. Supplications. It's when you don't know what to do and you want God's direction and you're willing to do whatever God shows you, but you need God's direction. Supplications. It's, some, it's a, when you get to a place in prayer where you're in total dependence upon God, that you put him in his rightful, sovereign place and you're kneeling before him and asking him to do what you yourself cannot do. That's supplications. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, those are your concerns. Those are the things that you would like to happen in your life. But please notice the last phrase. It says, for all men. God is very much concerned that we are praying for ourselves and for other people. He's not, it's not mentioned in this list of the Apostle Paul that we're praying for stuff. And too often in our own lives, James says this, that you sometimes do not get the answers to your prayers because you ask amiss. You ask for stuff that you can consume upon your own lusts. And too often we are very much caught up with material things. And the Apostle Paul here says that prayer really should be about people. So prayers. You know, God, what do you want me to do with my life? You know, you have some control over that, but you want God's guidance. Lord, there's two good things that I could do, but I can't do both. Which good thing do you want me to do? Prayers. God, there's so many people that I could spend time with at school. What are the right people for me to be around? The ones that are going to draw me closer to you. Lord, how can I do right in the relationships I'm in? The relationships with my parents, the relationships with my brothers and sisters, the relationships with my teachers, for some of you, the relationships with your coach. How can I do right in those relationships? Those are prayers. So first of all, supplications, prayers, and now intercessions. So this is really part of where prayer can be a ministry. You know, every person under the sound of my voice can already minister for God in this way. Intercession. Praying for other people. You know, oftentimes, you as students know things that are going on in the lives of other students that the teachers and the coaches and the administration, we don't even know about. But you know that it's going on in their life, and you can be praying for them, and you can intercede on their behalf. And you can pray for the concerns that are going on in their life. And you know, sometimes we hear what's going on in people's lives and we don't even know what the answer is, but God does. And we can pray on, on their behalf. You know, part of 
You being here at school and being in Bible class and being in chapel is so that you'll become more and more like who Jesus is. And right now, as we're sitting on, in chapel, Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. If you're saved this morning, Jesus is praying for you. And if we're going to become more like Jesus, then our prayers need to start becoming more about other people and less about ourselves. And we need to pray and intercede for those people that somehow, some way, you found out their need. Now, um, at our church on Wednesday night, we put out a prayer list, and it lists all kinds of things, and we, we take prayer requests from people. You know in Bible class that the prayer requests are given. How seriously do you take those things? And are those the only times you pray? Is when somebody else is prompting you to pray for other people? Or do you have time set aside? It says, first of all, is that the way you start your day in prayer? Look at verse 1 again. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. When's the last time you thanked God? Now, I'll just be honest with you. We take, in, in my Bible class, we take prayer requests and praises. And if I had to think last year, the amount of prayer requests to praises, I would be fortunate, I'd be fortunate if it was 90% prayer requests and 10% praises. And yet God says that part of our time in prayer is to thank God for what he's given us and to be thankful if you have any kind of experience, and many of you have family members in all different kinds of countries around the world, if you have any kind of experience of the type of lives that other people live in other countries, you ought to be thankful for what we have in America. If you have any kind of experience, I could tell you, I went to public school my whole life through 12th grade. If you have any kind of experience that and know that you get to come to this school and get to have the things that this school gives you, you ought to be thankful that God, what God's given you. If you're saved this morning, you ought to thank God that you're saved. Yes, you may have things that you go through, but you get to go through those things with God, not go through those things without God. How often are we thankful, are we grateful to God in prayer? And then I, I mentioned already, be made for all men. Now, in a typical day, I teach 115 kids. In a typical week, I probably teach about 130 people between Sunday school, Wednesday night, and the kids that I teach at school. That's a lot of people to interact with. You know, you've got a lot of people that you probably interact with in your class, probably 20 people, just your classmates, probably seven teachers, your parents, probably 30 people a day that you interact with. And the Bible says that we ought to pray for or be thankful for all men. How often are you thankful for the relationships that God's placed you in and the relationships that God's given you? Those relationships don't always last forever. You know, being at this school, you have a unique experience. I don't know if you understand. It's not always this way at public school. But some of you will go to school with the same kids your whole entire life. We see it every graduation, right? We see the group of kids that were here their entire life. I can't even comprehend that. Uh, when I was your age, uh, we probably moved every three years, easy, sometimes more than every three years. And the idea that you get to be with these people the, the whole entire life, and so often, how often do we hear in senior chapel, well, I never knew this guy that I went to school with my whole entire life until I was stuck in a room with him on senior trip, or I spent uh, 27 hours on the bus trying to get to New Jersey. And uh, finally, I met this person I'd spent my whole life with, God says we ought to be thankful for the men that people, that God has put in our life. Are you thankful for those people? And do you pray for those people? You know, we're sitting in chapel this morning and there's this pattern, you know. There's this group of seniors and that group, that, that set of seats keeps changing. And as you go through chapel each year, you know, you move to your different sections. Well, there's a group of people that used to be here that aren't here. Do you think about them? Do you pray for them? Paul says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Look at verse 2. For kings 
and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, when Paul wrote this, he was writing it while there was a Roman government that was strongly opposed to Christianity and specifically against Paul. And yet he said we ought to pray for all those that are in authority. Now, however you feel about the president, we don't have a king, however you feel about the president, you ought to pray for him. You ought to pray for him to have a sound mind. You ought to pray for him to have, make wise decisions. You ought to pray for him to have physical health. You ought to pray for the person who rules your country. No matter how you feel about that person, you ought to pray for them. And for all that are in authority, well, you're a student. It seems almost sometimes overwhelming how many authorities you have in your life. If you're a normal student, you don't have any teacher that repeats, you have seven different teachers. Uh, you have your two parents. Uh, some of you decide you're gonna have coaches, right? So you have all these authorities in your life. You have, you have the administration, okay? All these different authorities that you interact with and you seem, you seem to feel like sometimes that how can, I, how can I make all these different people happy? They don't even all want the same thing. Well, it starts by praying for them, by praying for them. I can tell you, if you're, if you're sitting here, your parents are making a sacrifice for you to be here. How often do you pray for them, and how often are you thankful for the sacrifice that they're making? Being an authority isn't easy. Making decisions for other people isn't easy. It comes with a lot of accountability, and it comes with a lot of consequences. If you don't make the decisions the right way, do you pray for them? People in authority have to make decisions constantly, and many times they have to make the decision in the moment. They don't get time to think it through or to plan it out. Do you pray for those that are in authority? Now, what, what does all of this activity and prayer, what does it move into your life that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty? So you ought to pray for all these things so that there could be peace in your life. You ought to pray for peace in your home. You ought to pray for peace in your school. You ought to pray for peace in your country. You know, right now, with everything that's going on in Ukraine, do you ever think about the fact that there's a whole bunch of kids in Ukraine that for six months, their life, maybe it's seven months now, their life has just been turned upside down? They, they don't get to just get up in the morning and go to school like you do. I mean, imagine how much school was interrupted with the pandemic. That's nothing compared to what they're facing with the war that's going on. And so you ought to pray that God would bring peace into your life, but also that you would be at peace. That you yourself, in your heart and in your mind, that you'd be at peace. That you'd be at peace with God, and that you'd be at peace with those authorities that are in your life, that you might have peace, and that you might live a life in all godliness, in all godliness, that you'd pray that you'd become more godly. You know, we hear Mr. Thompson very often pray in chapel that, that you would be godly young people. How often do you pray that you would be godly young people? You know that I'm involved in missions, and man, I enjoy missions. But I will tell you this, there are so many older missionaries that are still serving because young people aren't going into missions. And there's so many missionaries that came home during the pandemic that never went back. And there's so many young people that were gonna be missionaries that because when they graduated school it was a pandemic, they didn't go out. We need godly young people. People that God can use to minister to all those countries. And there's something about this group of people that so many of you already know Spanish. And you could be a much better missionary than, than Mr. Schroeder or, or even some of the people that come because there are so many Spanish-speaking countries that you could just walk right into 
and communicate with the people. But are you living a godly life in preparation for whatever God may call you to do? Now, I'll just be honest with you. I didn't get saved until I was 17, about one month before I graduated public school. I didn't really understand much about the Christian life at all. Sure, I went to a church, but it didn't really teach me like the Bible was something real that you were supposed to listen to and obey and live. It just didn't, the church that I went to. It was religious, but it certainly wasn't righteous. You don't know what God wants to do with your life. Why not be godly? So that if God calls you, you're qualified. There's no regrets. There's nothing you're looking back or doubting about. That we talked about this doubting early. That God could use you. That God's preparing you now. I, I know it's hard for you to understand, but the guys that I teach in the Dominican, they're lucky if they go through eighth grade. Some of them get to go through high school. Precious few ever go to college. And yet there are pastors responsible for churches. Some of you have more Bible training than they do because you get Bible every day and you get chapel once a week or more. What are you doing with that? In all godliness, and then look at this one, honesty. So if you're going to pray to an almighty God who knows everything, then you've got to be honest with God. And God would say, the more you pray and the more honest you are with God, it would be great if that honesty bled into your life if that honesty began to permeate your life. See, being honest with God leads to be honest with other people. And we live in this unique place, right, a Christian school, where even if you're new here, by the end of this year, you will know the other people in your class. And you will know your teacher. And your teacher will know you. You won't be able to hide you from the other students. You won't be able to hide you from the teacher. But the teacher will not be able to hide themselves from you either. You're going to spend a whole year with them. And some of you, like I said, you've been here forever and know people forever. Wouldn't it be great if we're just honest? God says prayer leads to a peaceable life, a quiet life, godliness, and honesty. Why is this so important? Look at verse 3. Why is prayer so important? Look at verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. That's who we should be living our life for. That's whose approval we should be seeking. Uh, they tell me there's so many platforms, right? And that on all these platforms, you know, you can like people or you can you know, repost their po tweet or the, whatever it is that you could show your approval is the idea. Over and over again across all these different platforms, you can share stuff with all kinds of people. Shares and likes and all this kind of stuff. I wonder sometimes if we get too caught up with what other people think and we aren't thinking enough about what is good and acceptable in the sight of God. Because he sees all. And not just in the sight of God, but God, our Savior. And, that, and that's verse 4. What else we can add to our prayer list? Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? It's God's will that everyone would be saved. If you don't get saved, it won't be because of God. It's God's will that you would be saved. Now this year we have so many new students and I wonder how many of our returning students have you even taken the time to find out if those kids are saved? Or maybe you've been around those kids already long enough to know that they're not saved. Are you praying for their salvation? If you're sitting here and you're not saved and you're wondering what in the world does that mean to be saved, then when we have partners in prayer next week, would you please let that teacher know? that you're not saved. And they'll take the time to explain the gospel to you. But we should be praying for people that are not saved. Then this always amazes me. How about your family? How many of you, th I'm not asking for a raise of hands, I want you to think. How many of you know people in your family that are, they're not saved? Are you praying that they would get saved? Um, I prayed for my mom to get saved, I want to say decades decades. My mom lives with me now. I got to disciple my mom when she first came and moved with us. I got to lead my mom to the Lord. But it wasn't until I had prayed for decades for my mom to get saved. Do you pray 
that people will get saved. Next week, we're going to have a, a, a great opportunity. We're going to have partners in prayer. I hope you take it seriously. I hope this morning you see a pattern in God's scripture here in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4 and in verse 8 of things that you can pray for, a list that you can have. If you don't have a prayer list on your phone, can I recommend that you put a prayer list on your phone? And the next time you have a few minutes, don't jump into a game, jump into some prayer. Or don't jump onto social media, jump into prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. We thank you that it's just eminently practical. You tell us what you desire in our life. And Father, I pray for these young people that you would place within them a spirit of prayer. And this morning, I pray for Puerto Rico and for all the people that are there. And Lord, I pray that the power would come back on and I pray that um, you'd help them to recover from the storm that's hit them and that you would just protect them in the time it takes for them to get things back to normal. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me thank you, Mr. Schroeder. Let me uh, wrap up before we dismiss, if I could have your attention, please. Just a couple things to follow up with Mr. what Mr. Schroeder shared with us this morning. Um, I, I love the idea. Uh, first of all, let me say this. Great, great emphasis this morning on prayer. Um, I can't emphasize enough and, and follow up with Mr. Schroeder any better than just to emphasize take prayer seriously in your life every day. Pray, pray, pray for everything, little and big. Great, great message this morning on prayer. Young people, I'm praying throughout the day uh, as I've gotten older there's times that I wake up in the middle of the night and uh, I find myself praying, praying for many different things. And so take opportunities to pray at all times. Um, I loved what he said about, you know, we always get on our phones for whatever. Have that prayer list. And when you do get on your phone, before you go to social media, take a few moments and pray what's on your prayer list there. And then lastly, he mentioned about next Monday's chapel. It is our Partners in Prayer Chapel. Those of you that uh, are returning, you kind of remember it from last year. Uh, we'll meet in here like we always do. We'll have our announcements. We'll sing, and then we are going to dismiss. Uh, at some point this week, Mrs. Abbott will be posting outside the media center on the wall in the hall there the lists of where uh, your P Partners in Prayer group will uh, meet and who uh, your leader is, okay, ladies with a... Uh, a lady faculty member uh, and gentleman with a, 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 a gentleman or a male faculty member, and uh, they'll lead you in partners in prayer. It's a great opportunity. It's a smaller group setting, um, and it's an opportunity to get a little more um, open about your where you are in your life. Maybe you are or you're not saved. That's first and foremost. And then uh, maybe you can open up a little about your testimony and maybe some burdens that are on your heart. A burden is something that is, is really taking up your mind uh, and concerned about something. So that's, that's what that is with partners in prayer. So be thinking about it, praying about it this week, and we look forward to that next Monday. Okay, we're going to dismiss at this time. I do need to have uh, Jude, Jason, and Tomas to come on up here, please. Uh, I want to get a selfie with you guys. Seniors, you are dismissed. Seniors are dismissed. I'm going to get a selfie with these three guys. Um, I may even get my hair cut like them. All right, seniors, you're dismissed. Ninth grade out the back, double doors. Tenth grade out the back, or the side, double doors.